everyone, welcome back to our international round rounds. I'm pleased today to have a guest speaker, a friend of mine, Caroline Hart. Good morning, Caroline. Good morning. So today's topic very interesting because of this pandemic, the raise in attention to olfaction and uh, olfactory disorders raised a lot. So we, we want to clarify the methodology and how to assess um, the olfactory disorders. And in regards to this, uh, I've requested Caroline to have a talk on uh, the sniffing sticks and the methodology on how to assess and how to interpret the, the data from an olfactory test uh, screening. Caroline is from uh, the University Catholic de Louvain. Is, is, is it correct? Sorry. It's perfect. From Bruxelles. So uh, I remind all the attendees to type your question for, uh, the, for Caroline, and we will reply to your question at the end of the talk. So Caroline, please share your screen. Thank you, Puya. Thank you for the invitation. And good afternoon, everybody. So can you see my screen now? Yeah. So indeed, today's topic is the sniff and stick test, how to do it and how to interpret it. So olfactory disorders are quite common in general population, affecting up to 20% of the population. And it's a frequent complaint in ENT consultation. And this is even more true since the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that olfactory dysfunction severely impacts the quality of life and therefore proper management and counseling to the patient should be performed. And for that purpose, it's a knowledge that adequate evaluation is mandatory. But what means adequate evaluation? That means that we should perform for each patient a thorough medical history assessment and clinical examination, that we should assess olfactory function, and we can use additional tests such as MRI. So one question is how to assess olfactory function. One easiest way would be to ask the patient to raise olfactory function. But actually you can see in this figure, it's a study from Landis, that if you ask people to rate their olfactory function and if you correlate it with measured olfactory function, so the TDI score, you see there is no correlation between both. So self-evaluation is not reliable. Another issue is when you consider the initial complaints of patients. So these are patients coming to smell and taste clinic. You see that majority of patients initially complain of smell and taste dysfunction. But if you measure smell and taste function of these patients with specific psychophysical tests, you see that actually only a few have smell and taste dysfunction, but a large majority have isolated smell dysfunction. This reflects the frequent confusion we all have between smell and taste. And for this reason, when you see patients with olfactory complaints, you must properly assess olfactory function based on psychophysical tools. Several psychophysical tests exist to assess olfactory function. There are the autonasal testing, like the upset, so the upset is a scratch and sniff test. So you scratch an area, you smell, and then you have to identify another. You have the sniffing sticks. You also have retronasal testing. It's powdered that are applied uh, in the oral cavity. And today we will focus on the sniffing sticks. Sniffing sticks were described in 1994, 97, sorry, by Thomas Hummel. And since then, this test has become very common and is widely used, uh, notably in Europe. So how to do the sniffing sticks? Sniffing sticks are pens filled with liquid odorants. There are several versions, and the most common ones are the screening test with 12 odorants, the extended test with threshold discrimination and identification, and the kids test. Recently, an additional identification kit has been produced, so you can assess up to 32 odorants with identification in the extended test. Screening test and kit test are identification tests 
And as I previously said, for the extended test, not only you have identification, but you are also able to assess threshold performance and discrimination performance. To do the, screen, the sniff and stick, you should put yourself and the patient in good conditions. That means you should do it in a well-ventilated room. You should ask your patient not to eat, drink, or smoke one hour before the test. The patient must be blindfolded, as you can see here, notably for threshold and discrimination tasks to avoid visual identification. As an operator, you should not wear perfume, you should wear odorless gloves. And what is very important is that throughout the, te the test, you should not provide any feedback to the patient. We know that our cultural background uh, influence our olfactory abilities, notably regarding identification performance. So it's very important to use culturally adapted version of the test. And another important thing is that it's a multiple forced choice procedure meaning that at the beginning of the test, you should inform the patient that even if he doesn't know what it is, he should give you an answer. This is really important and this is common to all psychophysical tests. The patient is forced to give you an answer. The first reason for this is that it's easy for the patient to say, I don't know. And if you force him, maybe he will retrieve some information. And the second reason is potentially to detect uh, malingering. So once you remove the cap, you place the sticks two centimeters in front of the nostril and you hold it for three seconds. You can assess olfactory function birinally, meaning two nostrils together, or you can assess one nostril at a time. When you perform the sniffing sticks, it's important to keep this sequence with first threshold, then discrimination, and finally identification. And threshold should always be performed first because in discrimination and identification task, um, the concentration of odorant is quite high. You are at a supra threshold level and you have some kind of habituation. And if you do threshold after that with the habituation, this will impair uh, threshold performance. You will see that it's quite easy to do the sniffing sticks. You just need a few training, but probably the most tricky part is the assessment of the threshold. In the threshold kit, you see that we have 16 triplets of sticks. You see here, first is the highest concentration, the other one is the red cap, and the lowest concentration is 16. You know it's threshold because you have this red line over there, and when you have the red line, the correct answer, the target is the red cap. So the red cap contains the other end. The two other sticks are blank. So it's just solvent without odor. And during the test, the patient must do a three alternative false choice procedure. So you present the three sticks and you ask him to identify the odor containing pen. The other end can be either phenyl ethyl alcohol or N-butanol, both kits are available. And as I told you, you have 16 dilutions. The interval between two sticks is around three seconds and between triplets, you should wait 20 seconds. At the very beginning of the test, give the first stick the strongest concentration to the patient so that he knows what is the, the target odorant he should detect. And to have a correct definition of the threshold, you should do what is called an ascending staircase procedure. What does that mean? Ascending means that we will start with the lowest concentration and we will progressively increase the concentration until the patient detects, until we have the threshold. But once he detects, we have to do a staircase procedure, so go up and down, to define correctly the threshold. And we obtain a score out of 16. Just to explain you this procedure, uh, this is a table. So you see there are seven columns because we do seven reversal. So I start with the lowest concentration, give the stick to the patient. Okay, the patient does not detect. I increase concentration by step of two. So I take sticks 14, test again, there is no detection. 
I increase until the patient gives a correct answer. If he gives a correct answer, I have to test again the same triplet. I do it again, the patient is wrong. I continue increasing. I test, the patient is right. I test again, he is right. This is the first reversal point. Then I will go toward lowest concentration. I give the lowest concentration to the patient and you see now that the step is one and not two. The patient is correct, I do it again, he's wrong, I stop. This is my other reversal point. And I continue it seven times, I do the same. And so you always go up until the patient gives you two correct answer and you always go down until you have at least one wrong answer. You do it several times. And to calculate the threshold, you have to do the average of the four last reversal points. And you obtain the threshold score for this patient, it's 825. For discrimination, you have also uh, 16 triplets of sticks. The subject is also blindfolded to avoid uh, visual identification. You see here is discrimination. You have this uh, green line and the correct answer, the target is the green. So in this task, in one triplet, we have two sticks containing the same odorant, the red and the blue, and the green one contains a different odorant. This is the target. Similarly, we wait three seconds between each six and more or less 20 seconds between the triplets. And the patient is asked to identify which of the three pens smells differently. And we obtain a score out of 16. And finally, for identification, classically we present 16 other ones to patient and patient must perform a multiple choice between four proposals. So for example, we give him one pen and ask, is it orange, blueberry, strawberry, pineapple? and the patient has to identify the correct odorant. And similarly, we have a score out of 16. You can use also verbal label. You can use picture. It depends uh, on your patient. For example, if you have patient that doesn't speak your language, picture are useful. Recently, I had a patient with a neurological disease, um, primary progressive aphasia. It's a kind of Alzheimer's disease. And this patient had trouble in identif identifying some object. So when I tell her, is it orange, blueberry, strawberry, pineapple? She was absolutely not able to complete the task. But based on picture, she could easily show the picture indicating uh, which is the other end. So you have to choose in function of your patient. So identification seems quite basic and easy to do, but still there are some tricks. And for example, you see here, if you ask the patient to read first, or if you ask him to smell first, you see that it changed the results. And if the patient read first, you have significantly better results than if the patient is smelling first. Probably because if he smells first, it can be quite confusing if the odor he receives is not the one that was expected. If you present verbal label and picture or only verbal labels, you see there is no significant difference between groups. So once you complete it, you have a score for threshold discrimination identification, you add this course and you obtain the global TDI score out of 48. So now you have done the test, how can you interpret it? For the screening test, screening test has only a positive value when uh, the function is normal. So if it's 11 or 12, you know that there is a normosmia and you can be reassured. If it's lower than 11, you have an overlap between hyposmia and anosmia. So if it's lower, you should go for extended test. For the U test, so the kids test, normosmia is considered as higher than eight. It's based on population from six to eight years old. Uh, be careful that below five to six years old, all factory tests are not really reliable. And in studies assessing the U test, so the kid test, um, 
this cutoff between normosmia and hyposmia uh, varied across countries and across age groups. And finally, for the extended test, we can rely on normative data and you should interpret your results with this normative data. And recently, you see that the normative data have been updated based on a sample of more than 9,000 subjects. With this data, the reference group, so the group with the better olfactory performance was the 21 to 30 years old group. And in this group, the cutoff between normosmia and hyposmia defined as the 10th percentile is 30.75 points. So if the score is higher, it's normosmia. If it's lower, it's hyposmia. And functional anosmia is defined as a score below 16. If you look at this publication, you will find these tables. So it's for this age group, 21, 30 years old, but you have similar tables for all age groups and you can compare to these tables and you are able to see the different percentiles. And for example, the 10th percentiles giving you this value, you see that normal threshold should be above 575, discrimination 11 and identification 11. From this study, you see that olfactory performance progressively increase until 21 to 30 years old and then decrease with age. The best performance with this group and females are usually better than men. It's not a big difference, but because there was 9,000 subjects, then it becomes obvious. Importantly, the different subtests are differently impacted by age. And you see here that thresholds are more affected by age in comparison to discrimination and identification performance. Other factors can also influence the results of uh, the subtest and notably cognitive factors. In this study uh, done by Edner and colleagues, they correlate cognitive functions with threshold discrimination identification performance. And you see there is this correlation between discrimination and identification performance and cognitive function. It was not the case for the threshold. In other words, we can say that thresholds reflect low level perceptual function, while discrimination and identification reflect higher level um, task with uh, high cognitive demand. So basically, when we have a patient with chronic rhinosinusitis, we know we expect threshold to be decreased, but discrimination and identification to be relatively correct. When we have patients with neurological disorders, thresholds are usually preserved, but discrimination and identification are impaired. And in the same vein, Whitcroft and colleagues try to evaluate whether there are some specific patterns of olfactory impairment in function of the etiology. And what they found is that in post-infectious and post-traumatic patient, identification performance were relatively more affected than threshold and discrimination. In sinonasal disease, as I previously said, thresholds are impaired. And in Parkinson's disease, thresholds are relatively preserved, but discrimination and identification performance are impaired. The TDI score is also particularly useful to give a prognosis to your patient, because when we see patient, one of the question is, will I recover um, my smell? Um, and regarding the different indicators, age is important, but the TDI score at the time of the diagnosis is also significantly associated to the chance to recover olfactory function. So the best the score is, the higher is the chance for the patient to recover. And finally, you know that olfactory dysfunction or olfaction in general is something very dynamic. So it's important to follow a patient and to monitor changes of olfactory function. And one important question is what is a significant improvement? And studies found that significant improvement is defined as an improvement of more than five to five points. Um, it was based on logistic regression showing that with this cutoff, 60% of subjects report also an improvement. So as a conclusion, 
Uh, I hope I give you useful information about the methodology of the sniffing sticks. Um, I would like to emphasize that when you see patient with olfactory dysfunction, you should assess this patient. You should use specific tool to have an idea of his olfactory function. Several tools exist. I don't have any interest with Burgard company. Uh, you can use sniffing sticks, but you can use Hubsit, but choose correct test for your specific population and your specific patients. Um, sniffing stick tests are well suited for European population and several adaptation exist. Few training is required, maybe a bit more for the threshold, but you should know the tips and tricks. Screening test is easy. You can, it just takes a few minutes, so it's easy to do it in outpatient clinic. Um, but the disadvantage is that it gives a rough information. So if it's abnormal, you should go for extended test. Extended test obviously gives you a more complete view of the situation, but it's time consuming. Considering the interpretation, don't forget to refer to normative values that exist. Have a look at the subtest. And don't forget that we face patients. So the test is one thing, but clinical examination and medical history are mandatory and you should interpret this test um, in integration with clinical examination and medical history. I thank you for your attention. And also I would like to announce our upcoming Alpine nasal course taking place uh, in France, in Léger, in January with a very nice list of speakers as you can see here. And Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, for, uh, for the presentation. I think that is uh, you, you really um, exhaustingly also um, show how to perform those tests. What are the limits? What are the news? What are the uh, every single step that you need to have in your rhinology clinic if you want to, of course, assess a patient that is suffering from olfactory disorders. And as you said, there are multiple disorders that should be assessed by using those tests. We didn't want to um, uh, report only sniff sticks as this, but since those uh, methodology has been used wisely recently, we, we try to tell the people or our colleagues on how to make efficiently those tests and how to make the interpretation. And as you said, also, there are also variables that are interestingly to note those, uh, those tests and, and what are the consequences of this. So let's go back to, our, to the question from the audience. The first uh, question is coming from Egypt and his colleague is saying, uh, you show seven sticks, but in the kit, there are only three sticks and how make those variations? Oh, sticks is 12 sticks. Uh, I think I think that he will reply again because it's not clear what he what he meant by this. It's, it was probably from the graph that you from the um, the table that you presented for the seven sticks with the sixteen uh, bars. Uh, we will we will try to uh, let him uh, type again. Let's go to the second question um, from Italy. Where do we find the orders from the identification tests? What are the samples that we can use? So for this test, so uh, sniffing sticks is, is commercially available. It's uh, um, sell by a company that is called Burgart based uh, in he, Germany. He replied, he said, I've lost my list. So how can I get one new? <laughs> <laughs> you can send a mail to Burgart and you will receive a, um, the offer. So once more, I don't have any interest. Okay, I use it regularly, but <laughs> uh. but there are a lot of there are a lot of tests. Of course, you don't have any. We we don't have any addition to this. Um, other question is coming from uh, uh, Germany. What tests do you use for parosmic patients? So parosmia is quite complicated because parosmia is really a perception for the patient. It's difficult to objectively assess parosmia. So you can use questionnaire for parosmia. Um, Landis developed a questionnaire and some questions are very specific for parosmia, so we use it. And also uh, a team from Austria developed um, a test for parosmia based on the sniffing and on, on the perception, hedonic perception of the sticks. Okay. From Brazil, how frequently we should assess the patients? 
it depends on the etiology of the, of the patient. So um, at the beginning, I, us I used to assess patient every year or every two years. Um, but now with the COVID, although we have more patients, I feel that to keep a motivation for the patients to do the training, it's nice to do at least a, a quicker test um, a few six months later after training, for example. If you have the possibility to do it, then you can. Uh, but I would say on a regular basis, I would assess patient one year after. And for post-traumatic patient, when you have medical legal issue, uh, you should assess patients two years later uh, for what is called consolidation to say whether the patient will recover or not. And when I have patient with idiopathic olfactory loss, uh, we know that these patients are at higher risk to develop neurodegenerative disease. And I like to follow up this patient every one year. Another question is coming from Greece. What are the best options for a screening test on a COVID-19 patient during, during the active disease? So there are several screening tests. I think if it's an active disease, I would not use the sniffing sticks because it's reusable test. So for hygienic purpose, I'm not sure it's a nice idea. I would rather use a scratch and sniff test. Um, so the, the few other ones you have, the less performant is your test. So obviously if you could, you would use the upset, but the problem is one kit for the upset is uh, 50 euros, I think, something like that. So it's quite expensive. Uh, but there are some data with only four or five other ones. Uh, but it's just a screening test. So there are several reasons why people may have a loss of smell. So, um, but I would go for scratch and sniff test. If you have a multi-billionaire company a clinic, then you can go for the sniffing sticks. But I think that once you yes. use it for COVID-19 patients, then you need to throw it in a garbage. So yes, those those uh, I didn't receive the reply from the colleagues who were asking actually the the seven sticks table. Um, so I don't I don't I don't know actually what what was the the question in there. So I if if we have any news, I will report it to you. Then you will be able to reply on this. On this, is it any anything that you would like to stress before closing the remarks in here, in in regards to the interpretation on or uh, what are the flow chart that you will suggest to a new uh, colleagues? Well, I would say that um, it's. Um... In an ideal situation, we have to test people with this extended test, but I know that in practice, uh, it takes time. Um, and so it's sometimes difficult to implement it in clinic. But I think if you have an interest in olfaction, it's really important to have su such tests. And also another important thing is that if you do ear surgery, you would never make surgery without a test. Um, a strinologist, I, I won't say that we don't care, but it's not routinely based, uh, routinely done, I would say, to, to measure olfactory performance before sinus surgery or rhinoplasty. Uh, yes, but it's something that makes sense. I think that what you just said is very important. The, the pre-operative assessments uh, are very important. We, as a rhinologist, we don't use it frequently, but we now has been stressed uh, of the importance of validate, validated questionnaire to assess our patients in regards to this, for example, the SNOT22, NPS, uh, lung McKay score for the radiology assessment. So why not using also olfactory tests? Of course, we don't have the time, as you said, but probably a, a small identification test, even that one will help a lot in the post-operative management or in the assessment of a patient, or as you said, for other diseases that are not only related to rhinology, or for, for example, Parkinson's disease. Those are, you know, uh, tests that should be uh, assessed before in any neurological department. And in regards to this, we have these questions coming from a rhinologist uh, 
colleagues who is saying, can we, are we allowed to perform olfactory tests in our patients or is it just allowed for an ENT? Everyone is allowed to do that. Uh, there is no, we do it as ENT because, you know, it's the, it's the nose and usually it's ENT. And I think that uh, when you do this test, as I said, clinical examination is important. So when you have a patient with olfactory dysfunction, you must be sure he doesn't have a nasal polyposis before considering it's Alzheimer's or Parkinson. Um, but everyone can do the sniff and sticks. Perfect. I, I, I do agree with this too. So thank you, Caroline, for your participation. Thank of you. course, for anyone interested, I remind you that uh, uh, the, the, this uh, talk has been recorded and is available on our social media platforms. You can watch it again on YouTube or on Facebook. You can, you can go to our YouTube channels and you can watch it again and share with your colleagues. Uh, I remind you the upcoming meeting, uh, December 8, Wednesday, 2 p.m. We have Gopi Shah from Dallas, USA, uh, which is going to talk about children with cystic fibrosis sinus diseases. Thank you once again, Caroline, for your participation. And okay. I hope that we can, have, we can move forward. And uh, I remind all the attendees uh, to uh, kept informed and participate in the um, meeting provided from Caroline. Uh, what was the date? It's uh, 12 to 16 January. Perfect. Thank you so much. Stay Thank safe, you. everyone. Bye.